Hey there everybody, this video will cover a quick review for every truck in SnowRunner working through in category order with labeled chapters so you can easily navigate around. We will start with the vanilla trucks and then work through the year passes and rounding off with additional content so sit back and enjoy. So starting off with the Scout class we have the Chevrolet CK1500, the starting vehicle and a solid scouting workhorse for a long long time. It improves with the upgrades you collect for it and is able to haul a good amount of spare fuel and repair parts once you have gained a few ranks. Even later into the game you can still rely on this little truck even in a moor. However, avoid towing trailers with this. The truck's relative low ground clearance can be an issue for towing. Next we have the Don 71 which is a funny little rock crawler if you take your time. Despite its tiny profile, you can get some relatively beefy mud tires on it up to 35 inches in diameter. However, like the Chevy CK1500, you will want to avoid towing trailers with this Scout. The roof rack can make the top a little heavy, but with autonomous winch fitted, you'll be driving along for days and days recovering where necessary with only a low fuel consumption level, though with all-wheel drive on a toggle, that will cost you. On to the Hummer H2. Now I have never really been a big fan of the Hummer in SnowRunner or in general. I find it a bit dull and in the game it's very quiet, it barely just rumbles along. Definitely a scout that suits the freeway gearbox but does struggle a bit in mud and snow because it lacks ground clearance, even with the suspension lift kit installed. It can perform okay at towing scout trailers but definitely don't rely on it. It can however haul a good number of spares across two combined add-ons for assisting other trucks and scouts. Next is the International Lordstar 1700 and do not sleep on this thing. Not only is it only one of two scouts that can have a small crane add-on to aid in rescues and cargo loading, but it also has a ton of power, plus all-wheel drive and diff lock always on, so once you get it into the high range just watch it fly. Definitely suited to several roles if you swap the frame out on C requirements, but out of the box, this is one of the best performing scouts you can get. Capable of hauling and loading its own trailer for cargo recovery missions, this truck will earn its keep in no time, plus it has a sick paint job. Moving on to the legend that is the Khan Loaf, it may be lacking in power, but it is hella fun to drive. Not particularly quick and top heavy with its roof rack, Though I don't know that anybody that doesn't truly enjoy in driving this just a little bit. The fact that this comes with all-wheel drive and diff lock always on is always a win as well. A bit of a meme truck, but to be honest, it can save you in a bit of a pinch with some much needed repairs and supplies. The Scout 800 is practically a toy truck compared to everything else because it's so small in this game. It'll probably be your second Scout unless you have the DLC, but definitely give it a try though. I think it's a bit of a love-hate relationship with this thing. You'll want the higher suspension ride for the ground clearance, but then you'll be fighting being top heavy and risk rolling over a lot when you've got the roof rack installed. Not super powerful, so you won't be expecting this thing to tow or save another vehicle, that's for sure. Up next is the Tuz 166, which is another tiny scout with the ability to fit huge mud tires. Very old school in its workings, but the combination of all-wheel drive and diff lock always on, coupled with its Amor engine buff, can turn this thing into a demon. Like all of the small scouts, avoid scout trailers really, as you'll just be winching yourself from A to B, which is really no fun. The roof rack on this scout is more suited to keeping itself going rather than aiding other trucks that are in peril. Tank time now with the Tuz 420 Tatarin. This behemoth has the best tires in the game. It's eight wheel drive, four wheel steer, and has a mammoth 300 liter fuel tank plus extra supplies on the roof rack. If you need to go somewhere that doesn't have any form of road or track to get there, then this is what you use. The handling is great and it's pretty fast for a truck with the advanced special gearbox. The only issues though are that this monster cannot tow a trailer in the conventional sense and there is no snorkel, so be careful in water or you'll get wiped out really quickly. Oh and did I mention that you can get this for free, multiple times. Finally the Yar 87, a 6x6 beast that can in fact tow trailers and do it well. Its big balloon style tyres ensure plenty of grip and traction. This accompanied by its excellent fuel consumption levels make it a fantastic choice for exploring and rescue. All-wheel drive is on a toggle as opposed to the always on diff lock, 
but that doesn't really matter. The increase in fuel consumption is nearly negligible. A strong hauler, plus it's super affordable and at a fairly low rank, a solid pick for any playthrough of the game. Having covered the base game scouts, now we will look at the heavy duty trucks, starting with the Caterpillar CT680, which is another one of those trucks you want to love, but there are just a few niggles that take away from its practicality. The biggest drawback is that there is no raised suspension kit for it, and the rear of the chassis rides so low on the axles that it seems as if there's no suspension at all, so the ground clearance can be a really big problem. However, the cat has a beast of an engine, so it will shift like stuff off a shovel uh, once upgraded, and you'll be able to take full advantage of all-wheel drive and diff lock. Another great point is the truck's versatility, as you can equip nearly every other add-on lacking just the Vibra size unit. I would avoid using the high saddle though with this truck, especially with the super heavy trailers given the ride height issues. Next is the Chevrolet Kodiak C70, which fans of my hard mode series will know is an absolutely capable truck, even all the way off in Far and More where I use this truck for light cargo and scouting. A good ride height, modest fuel tank and decent power will allow this truck to trundle through most conditions without too much fuss. This is commendable as this is one of the earliest trucks you'll pick up as it is situated in Black River and it just requires rescue. Driven properly, this truck will see you through the whole game. Back to basics now with the Fleetstar F2070A which is the third vehicle you will own. This faithful workhorse can put in the hours and nearly single handedly see you through Michigan on its own. Versatile and strong, it will get you to where you need to go and haul along multiple units of cargo at the same time. It's a great candidate for crane and flatbed options and not too damaging on the bank balance for fuel in hard mode either. Another one of those lifelong friends you'll come back to again and again. The final heavy duty truck is the White Western Star 4964, which may be rescued from an awkward position in Smithville Dam, but is definitely worth it. Another early game powerhouse that will happily work alongside the Fleet Star, just be careful with all wheel drive though, as it will potentially drain your fuel tank faster than anticipated. This is one of those trucks that is set in for getting high range, as it just has a knack for getting through tough terrain, just buffing progress from time to time with the all wheel drive function. Plenty to offer and pretty good looking, worth keeping hold of for sure. Taking an even quicker look at the highway trucks now, beginning with the Ford CLT 9000 and this thing exists for the ultimate SnowRunner challenge. No all wheel drive or diff lock, but a multitude of add-ons are available. A truck that seems ideal for roads of Alaska, however beware, if you equip the chain tires then do not venture into the mud. If you stick with the regular UOD2 tires, you can get pretty far in off-road conditions, though you'll be changing gear a lot. High gear is a good start for skimming over the tough ground, but once the mud deepens, you'll be wiggle steering and gear changing very frequently, but it can be done. Next is the starting truck, the GMC MH9500. This started with a hard life, most likely being abandoned shortly after in acquiring some new vehicles. However, due to updates allowing more usability further into the game, it can fill pretty much any add-on you require. It has good torque, allowing the truck to traverse conditions that aren't too deep or wet. Shallow snow and mud with the right speed and driving style are very achievable. Lastly in this category, we have the International Transtar 4070A. Just like the Ford, there's no all-wheel driver diff lock availability at all, so rolling with off-road tires and having to change gear constantly to keep moving is required. One thing I forgot to mention about on the Ford, and it applies to this, is to equip the longest winch possible for those tricky situations. Given the shorter length of the truck, add-ons are slightly limited, as are their combination potentials. 265 litres will keep you going for a good while, and being a cab over design means that it'll be hard to get it wedged in dips and ditches. Now it's time for the big boy heavy trucks. The Azov 4220 Antarctic is unique in that it is one of few trucks in the game that has hydraulic articulated steering in the same nature as the Cat 745C, so they can take a little bit of getting used to. The six-wheel drive behemoth can plow through the harshest terrain with its enormous tires. Capable of utilizing a flatbed or hauling logs, it will definitely get your cargo to the destination, though be wary as its height can work against it in certain situations, so beware of advanced cambers and boulder fields. 
Next is the Azov 73210 with its infamous low riding bumper. Chassis design is essentially that of a mobile crane with 10 wheel drive and 6 wheel steer allowing for excellent handling and manoeuvring in tight spaces. Multiple flatbed length options are available as well as is the ability to still haul the trailer and use a small crane which makes this truck very versatile and one of my favourites. Even more so with its active suspension upgrade allowing you to raise the height of the bumper enough to get it out of trouble. As long as you don't bury the truck into a gully at speed then you'll be just fine. The Cat 745C has had a weird life in SnowRunner, losing and gaining utility across multiple updates. One of the first two trucks to have articulated steering, this mammoth chassis would just about get you anywhere you need to as long as it isn't too icy. All-wheel drive and diff lock are on a toggle but it really doesn't matter. The all-wheel drive system does not consume more fuel when engaged so have it on at all times. An excellent medium log hauling truck and a brilliant refueling aid where necessary. This is a definite must have in your trucking arsenal. Just avoid water that comes up to the radiator grill. Over to the Dan 96320 now. I haven't always had the best relationship with this truck. I've always found it a bit lacking and I, and I know there are others that kind of swear by this truck. Slightly off in shape and design, I feel like its potential is limited by the position of the gearbox as this truck could have had a triple slot bed. Able to run pretty much any add-on, I use this truck as a crane vehicle in my hard mode series. All-wheel drive and diff lock are always on and it has the advanced special gearbox which is great coupled with unique independent suspension for each wheel maximizing your contact with the ground. The Derry Longhorn 3194 used to be fairly useless, but after a few updates it has renewed life, enabling the dead axle to be lifted and the addition of diff lock always on, and the all-wheel drive was switched to always on too. Built as a specialist for low and high saddle loads, this truck has a lot of power and makes for a great low saddle hauler that you can get for free in Alaska too. One of the largest fuel tanks in the game at 370 litres gives you a lot of distance you can cover without needing to refuel. Just be cautious of the truck's not so amazing turning radius. The larger Derry Longhorn 4520 comes from the same design and function as the DL3194 being built as a heavy hauler but with some improvements over the original design. This is now an 8x8 truck, though the all-wheel drive and diff lock are on a toggle which means you will consume more fuel, but this truck is able to hold logs as well as low and high saddles. The single biggest fuel tank in the game at 400 litres should enable long distance hauling easily. Front and rear steer improves the turning radius tenfold to help you navigate those tricky woodland tracks while towing a trailer. A weakness though is that this truck just seems to lack power. Now onto the larger of the two Kolob trucks. The Kolob 74760 is an absolute unit with its massive 8x8 twin steering chassis, huge tires and train like appearance making this one formidable truck. Only able to run a high saddle it is dedicated to that sole role, getting those massive tires wherever they need you to go. All wheel drive and diff lock always on means you can just high gear this thing at a fair rate enabling it to smash through the majority of conditions without breaking a sweat. However the ride height can cause a problem so make sure you grab its active suspension upgrade where you can. A 380 litre fuel tank and a fairly decent consumption rate means you won't need to be following this truck with a tanker. The nosy Kolob 74941 is at this point a slight oddity when it comes to massive trucks as it requires a fair amount of micromanagement to keep fuel consumption limited, but also at traversing the elements. It has the same add-ons as its bigger cousin, the 74760, and was firmly the favourite over its train-like counterpart due to having a higher ride height. However, all-wheel drive toggle means you'll be consuming a lot more fuel and you will be varying your speeds. Still a trusty workhorse, but replaced by the bigger Kolob or the mighty Zix 605R coming later. The Pacific P12, another Marmite truck, somewhat of an oddity on release of the game as there was no logging contracts, and the Pacific Company are most renowned for that sort of thing. Anyways, big Canadian power vibes and a 350 litre fuel tank enable this heavy hitter to get haulage done. 
All-wheel drive on a toggle means your fuel consumption will vary when required, but it should prove a worthy ally and can even fit the new tires to the old girl. Not particularly quick, if that's what you're looking for, but it will keep you going on these windy switchback tracks and roads. Now onto the mighty P16, the early game beast, and if you google this truck you will see why. The IRL king of login has its own unique set of OHD tyres in the game, with one of the best dirt and mud ratings given to any set of tyres, giving it a huge advantage in poor conditions. Capable of tasks outside of logging also, this was the original heavy hauler for those that stayed in Michigan to begin with. An Omega level horn and diff lock always on will help you get pretty much anywhere, except for in the later DLC maps which can be a bit more unforgiving. This is down to the lack of all wheel drive which really kills the truck's performance on hills. I used this truck for one long log hauling contract in phase 3 and was just purely frustrated as the truck couldn't make turns or climb slopes. One worth keeping though to aid in recovery missions. Likely obtained at a similar stage to the P16, especially if you follow my starter guide, the Western Star 6900 Twin Steer was a truck that struck all players with awe when we first saw it in Island Lake. A monstrously long four cargo slot hauler with enormous tyres and an enormous thirst to match it. Only capable of hauling cargo on its flatbed, this 360 litre monster will get you to your destination in record time as it's surprisingly one of the fastest trucks in the game. Diffloc comes on a toggle, but unfortunately you'll have to go all the way into a Mandra for that all-important all-wheel drive upgrade, which is very naughty. That's right, you have to buy DLC to improve and upgrade this truck. And also it can tip over from time to time, so do be careful. Last but not least of the vanilla vehicles, the off-road trucks category. The speedy ANK Mark 38 is obtained for free in Alaska and is one of the fastest vehicles in the game. With balloon tires and a high range box, there are a few trucks that can match the torque and mud skipping prowess of the ANK Mark 38. However, there are several drawbacks. The main two being fuel consumption and stability. The high speed also makes you susceptible to damage more than other trucks, so that suspension will be gone in no time at all. Unfortunately, it can only be outfitted with a stock sideboard bed, though you can tow a trailer too. Definitely useful in it, but maybe shouldn't be relied upon in the long term. The mill spec as of 5319, with its piece livery, is up next, and I would enjoy this truck. It's powerful and fast and can carry an array of add-ons, but unfortunately it has a leaky fuel tank that only seems to be able to hold 200 litres of fuel at any given time which for a big 8x8 truck, I feel, is absurd. To me, it makes no sense. Even in the vehicle description, it mentions needing supply lines to run this truck, and I won't disagree that this truck is very capable with all-wheel drive and diff lock always on and having power for days, but driving it feels like you're on a time attack to get where you're going before the fuel runs out. One for short journeys and not for exploration. Now for some controversy. The Azov 64131, for me, is the best vanilla truck in SnowRunner. There, I said it. Excellent fuel economy, huge power, practically a full fleet of add-ons, great for low and high saddle loads, 8x8 powerhouse that is as steady as a rock and useful in every situation and available at level 2. It may be one of the slowest trucks, but who really cares? SnowRunner isn't a racing game. There are some time attack contests, but this truck isn't what you would use that for. There's plenty of other options. Where it does fall down, though, is if you have the loading crane equipped, then you can't tow a trailer when you've got the flatbed. Otherwise, you can normally. There is a lot of weight behind this truck, making it good for flipping over other trucks that have taken corners too quickly or have had a whoopsie-daisy. Anyways, moving on. The Freightliner 114SD is a truck that flies so under the radar for most people. And I'll be honest, I've barely used it myself. It's, uh, it's part of a group of trucks that are mostly the same in performance and characteristics. A diluted group of off-road class vehicles. You can equip most add-ons onto this truck and it has a solid 300 litre fuel tank. Though you will just burn through it all when the all-wheel drive is on, thanks to it being a toggle. Diff lock is also on a toggle, so you'll have to micro through terrain with varying conditions. 
It is fairly nice to drive and its center mass seems fairly low. There's no harm in trying it out, but you aren't really missing much if you don't. It's as vanilla as it gets. The Freightliner M916A1 is a truck I really should use more. On initial release, its steering was a mess, so it was left to the wayside. For a tractor-trailer combo, it's very small compared to its regular North American cousins, being able to use the low and high saddle and a loading crane, though you cannot use a saddle trailer with the loading crane. It's got a fair punch of power and a good ride height to help with muddy conditions. It does visually have a hose on the back, but this is just for show. Diffloc is always on to help with those high gear shenanigans through various terrains with all-wheel drive on a toggle for a little boost. Definitely one to try for Alaska or Belazersk due to the high volume of roads, as it is quick and it does tow well. The International Paystar 5070 is another early game gem if you have the money, a jack-of-all-trades North American truck that can actually run mud tires. Just be careful though of its high centre of mass or turning at speed will have you rolling over in no time. Capable of towing a trailer as well as running a flatbed in a crane, you'll be completing tasks and contracts left and right with this setup. Only minor downside really is the 240 litre fuel tank which feels like it's a bit lacking. And using all wheel drive system can drain you quickly if you're not paying attention in off-road conditions. As mentioned, this can be a solid ally across at least the vanilla game maps of Michigan, Alaska, and Tamir. Here is another early game truck for some easy cash, the Royal BM-17. With a certain setup, this thing is psychotic on toast. Huge ground clearance, mad speed, but crazy soft suspension means you'll be flying all over the place with this truck, as you'll see as I drive around like an absolute hooligan. No diff lock and all-wheel drive is on a toggle here, which I guess is kind of unique. Uh, it can fill a good variety of roles. For instance, I used this to haul a tanker trailer way back in the Amore Hard campaign. But you can also run it with a crane and a flatbed for those cargo recovery missions. It can see a lot of use early on, but maybe waning in the late game. The Tiny Step 310E is one of the few Eurasian trucks that cannot equip mud tires, which is fairly odd. Rescued from Tamir, this little roamer you can either love or forget, especially against the backdrop of all the other Eurasian trucks in the game. All-wheel drive and diff lock are on a toggle, and it has a fairly small fuel tank of just 220 litres, but it can, with work, get through rough terrain. This kind of truck for me is definitely more of a support role. Time for some more controversy. The Tega 6436, or Tega King, is a six-wheel drive beast that can off-road with the best of them. Primarily used by me for seismic vibrator module or as a recovery truck, a surprisingly thirsty truck, the fuel consumption can be very erratic, as you can see here, and I won't deny its mud traversal ability is solid but not infallible. Caught off guard, you'll have dug down into the mud in no time, leaving yourself with the task of crawling out of the mud like everybody else. The sleeper cab design also denies the truck's ability to run a crane and flatbed combo, meaning that if you want to haul cargo and use a crane, then you've got to go with the low saddle trailer route. Due to its speed capabilities though, do be careful on roads where there are sticks and rocks or you can say goodbye to your wheels and suspension. Onto the Voron Trio, the Voron AE4380 gets the hot rod livery and a lot of speed trolling through mud. Unable to utilize the fabled flatbed crane and trailer combo, it does boast all-wheel drive and diff lock always on for maximum performance regardless of conditions. An okay sized 250 litre fuel tank may need supporting for longer journeys, but its fairly low center of mass should keep it out of trouble generally speaking. Definitely one of those jack of all trades trucks. The Voron D53233 is up next with its larger fuel tank and its ability to use a crane, flatbed and trailer. It has a decent speed and power for getting through the mud, and you can pick up this truck early in the game from level 2, just the same as the Azov 64131, though obviously you won't have the mud tires until later on unless you're playing New Game Plus and starting beyond level 13. A well-rounded truck that should definitely be considered. You could easily run a fleet of these for the memes or just for the practicality of it. The Voron D matches the AE also in that it has all-wheel drive and diff lock always on. The final part of the Triforce is the Voron Grad. This one breaks the Voron mold with all-wheel drive and diff lock now on a toggle but a much larger fuel tank at 330 litres. 
It cannot run the crane flatbed trailer combo, but it does have very good ground clearance and a decent fuel economy despite the all-wheel drive toggle. Personally, I think it's the best looking of the three and it can get around with good speed with a high speed gearbox. It has a solid chassis weight too, so when using a crane, you won't be tipping over much unless you're on uneven ground or full extension, which everybody should already know is a bad idea. Ending the vanilla coverage with the Zix 5368, I have one use for this truck and it still kind of struggles, the magnetic detector module. This is because the module often takes up the main component area on the majority of trucks, but I never use this truck so it gets a promotion. It's essentially a big scout. It's worse than the Tuz Acteon, but it can have the metal detector and a one cargo flatbed if you're really feeling brave and you can still tow a trailer. If you're feeling ultra brave, equip the log loader crane. That will really test your nerves. It has a 190 litre fuel tank, which for anything outside of Scouts is tiny. Now that we have covered the vanilla trucks, we will begin working through the seasonal releases. So onto phase one and the Ford F750, which on initial release was a little underwhelming. However, once you pick up the engine upgrades, this truck really comes to life. It may only have four-wheel drive, but it definitely makes it work. Diff lock is always on, but the all-wheel drive unit is on a toggle. It has a slightly unusual bodywork layout, but it allows for you to become a mobile garage, letting you carry 330 litres of spare fuel, 500 repair parts, and 8 spare tyres, which is really, really useful. And I do kind of wish that I've had this in my hard mode campaign, but I've not yet been to Lake Cove. The truck handles well and providing conditions aren't too dire, it will get through muddy ground okay. If you aren't wanting the mobile garage function, then you can use this truck as a loader as it is one of the very few scouts to have a crane option available. However, do be careful that the truck is very light, so only use the crane when immediately next to cargo and the truck that needs loading, but this can be super useful in a tight rescue spot. Onto the Tuz 108 Warthog, and I'm really not a fan of this truck if it wasn't obvious from its dedicated review video. The biggest issue with this truck is the weight balancing, because it's all at the back. In the dedicated review, I demonstrated this by hauling a trailer, and that trailer was hitting the rear of the cabin, causing the front of the truck to be raised off the ground. Here, I have just the small tanker installed, and it's the same problem again. You can see the ridiculous levels of understeer this truck endures. It's almost as if the engine is tiny or doesn't weigh very much at all, which wouldn't be that accurate. Both all-wheel drive and diff lock are on a toggle, which isn't always ideal either. You can outfit this truck for a small variety of tasks, however, such as a tanker, a van body repairs, trailer hauler, or cargo, but I'm not convinced by its performance. However, you might like it. The Tuz 16 Acteon is a plucky little off-road truck and it does appear to be similar to the Warthog but it is much much better. The all-wheel drive and diff lock functions are on a toggle which is a bit of a letdown but the truck has actual decent weight balancing so it does well at getting through the mud on its massive tyres. It can run a fuel tanker, repair box or cargo sideboard bed and a long log carrier and a crane so it's capable of completing a variety of tasks. Though, like with the Ford F750, be careful with the crane as the vehicle is lightweight so it is prone to tipping over. I have used this truck for logging contracts, hauling long logs, and it does a surprisingly good job despite its size. In the same manner as the Ford, it is a little bit of a pain to get hold of, requiring some deep diving into phase 1 and some slow slow driving. You can haul a trailer from the rear hitch also, though results may vary, but it can be useful for resupply efforts. Now onto phase 2 where we took the delivery of the Caterpillar 770G, the frontman of phase 2 and the Tonka truck of SnowRunner. Put into the game for one purpose which was for hauling the heavy rock trailers which no other truck can move so you would assume it should be pretty good at doing that job, right? Well maybe not so much. Diff lock always on but not all wheel drive at all means that this truck will struggle on hills when towing but it does have a pretty good unique set of mud tires to help with those tricky spots. Be wary though as this truck does lack a snorkel which is a common theme with cat trucks for some reason excluding the roadworthy ones. As mentioned this truck's primary focus is the rock trailer hauling but it can also function as a tanker truck in the same manner as the cat 745C. However it is exceptionally square and oddly shaped. 
it does have a colossal 530 litre fuel tank paired with a not so terrible fuel consumption rate, which is it's actually pretty good. So it does have function for potential scouting or as a recovery vehicle. I may have been a little too harsh on it on its initial review, but you know, at least it is free. The Caterpillar TH357 telehandler caused a lot of excitement when it was revealed, though there are some definite shortfalls, which include no snorkel or the ability to pack cargo on the forks, which makes manual loading of cargo very finicky and potentially stressful. The intent of this truck was to facilitate the placement of cabin cargoes in the cabin areas for certain missions in the Yukon because the loading bays had a roof, denying cranes with easy access. This caused all sorts of decent issues, especially for cooperative play, so that's super fun. On the upside, you do have all-wheel drive and diff lock always on for maximum performance, and it can move at a decent pace, so potentially it can function as a semi-decent scout, as long as you're scouting dry areas. If you like to drive in first person though, do not do it in this truck as there is no suspension, as you'll just have a very, very bumpy ride. Onto the KRS 58 Bandit now, which is a truck made of random parts stuck together. The modified cabin of a bus, an eight wheel drive chassis and a gearbox system and an overpowered engine makes for a hilarious accident prone truck with just a 150 litre fuel tank, which may appear limiting, but you do have another 140 litres of spare fuel on the roof if you take that add on, along with repair points and a spare tyre. The biggest benefit of this truck is that it has the balloon tires and you couple this with a high range gearbox, enabling ridiculous speeds, but this can come at the price of fuel. Though it is able to equip pretty much any add-on you would require, uh, though I would avoid crane operations unless absolutely necessary as this thing will fall over regardless of whether or not you enable the outriggers, which of course don't actually do anything. I personally use this truck with the van body add-on for field repairs in hard mode and it has been clutched many many times like a rapid recovery unit. Phase 3 took us login using first the gigantic bore 45318. The size of this truck is absolutely absurd. I mean look at the air filter on the right side of the engine. I could probably fit inside it. Everything seems to be turned up to 11 for this truck. Even the visual add-ons which look like they've just been enlarged and stretched. Able to run several add-ons from the Vibra size unit or a high saddle or a van body repair unit makes it viable for a lot of different roles. This truck is rapid, but for heavy hauling, you'll have to be microing in and out of the all-wheel drive and diff lock as they are both on a toggle, meaning fuel consumption can get fairly high. No mud tire options to select from, but it does have OHD tires, which are still pretty solid. A big downside is the cost. This truck cannot be found in any map so far, and the truck costs $180,000 to buy, which is pretty ridiculous, especially as you can get more capable trucks for a lot less money. Give it a go at your own risk, but don't expect miracles. The International Paystar 5600TS is the thirst master that can rival the consumption of the Western Star 6900TS, except with a smaller fuel tank. All-wheel drive and diff lock are both on a toggle and I implore you to use the all-wheel drive only when absolutely necessary as you can easily exceed over 30 litres a minute for fuel consumption. However, this truck is capable of so many different tasks and has been a linchpin force in my hard mode campaign. Not that I would recommend it if you weren't playing by my rule set. I only use it as I cannot buy any other trucks. When all wheel drive is active, you will have 10 wheel drive, which is great for hauling logs or using that triple slot cargo bed and towing a trailer, allowing you to move up to seven cargo slots at once and have a loading crane too. You can opt for a weaker engine to save on the fuel consumption, but you'll then start to struggle more with heavier your cargo. This is a free truck that you can immediately get hold of, fully intact, but it's worth a try but watch out for the fuel gauge. Logging Genesis now with the Pacific P512PF, another easy to obtain truck from phase 3. This truck is a little unique in that like the P16 it has those unique tyres allowing for the best performance in mud at the cost of no all wheel drive and diff lock on a toggle. A variety of add-ons are available for this truck but it does look best when logging. It is fast and powerful, although do be aware on uneven tracks as you will roll and pitch and pivot in every single way imaginable. 
A big issue though is the fuel tank, which is a measly 200 liters, which if you're on roads is completely fine, but if you're off-roading, you'll be consuming in excess of 10 liters per minute, greatly reducing your driving time. I don't personally use this truck very often, but do take it out for a drive yourself as it is capable. On to phase four, which added the lovely sights of Amore and the Khan Sentinel, which is a bit like an upgraded Chevy CK1500. Although it is a slight pain to get hold of in Erska River, this pickup truck does not perform well on roads at all, but once it's off-road, it is okay, as long as things aren't too muddy. It can have decent power and ground clearance, making it capable of assisting trucks in the field with its spare fuel tires and repair parts on the roof and in the rear bed. But you aren't missing out on anything special, really, if you don't go out of your way to obtain the truck. Fuel consumption is okay, but it does decline when you enable the all-wheel drive, and you can tow a scout trailer with the Sentinel, though it comes with the usual scout trailer tropes of just being awkward and stuck all the time. Definitely a take it or leave it, no big deal kind of truck. And then finally, onto the king of SnowRunner, the Zix 605R. This is an eight-wheel drive, all-wheel drive, diff-lock always-on beast from the east. It can run any add-on except low saddle and the vibrosize module and the metal detector. It is not so great on icy roads and only has one set of tires available, but they're good tires. If you are going to use the saddle, then make sure to equip the spare wheel, which also holds additional spare fuel. A 380 litre fuel tank with 200 in reserve at least goes for days and stops for no terrain, so what more could you want? This beast may be a pain to get hold of initially in a more, but it is definitely worth it. An excellent recovery vehicle, heavy hauler, trailer tower, unmatched mammoth. For recovery operations, this is pretty much unmatched due to its sheer bulk. And on screen, you can see where I've used it for rescue. If you want to see its full capabilities, then watch the video linked in the top right. On to the year two pass and phase five, we received Tatra Force T8157. This truck is obtained after completing several missions in the Don region. See the card in the top right. This truck doesn't consume extra fuel with all-wheel drive engaged, so leave it on permanently. Unfortunately, the diff lock is on a toggle too, so you'll need the low gear to fully utilize the trait. The truck can have a few different add-ons, though not a huge amount, but including saddle high, fuel tanker, sideboard bed, loading crane, and ramped towing platform. I use this truck exclusively with its crane and sideboard bed as it can also tow a trailer making it a great candidate for 6 cargo missions. It has a fairly heavy chassis so it isn't easy to roll over either. A couple of downsides include that the loading crane, which is firstly very slow and secondly very bulky, making loading single cargo piece difficult when trying to get close to the crane. The truck's turning circle isn't particularly great either, so tight spaces will require some forethought. I wouldn't bother with the ramp towing platform to be honest, it's much easier just to tow a vehicle with a winch because at least you can keep the engine running. On the whole though, it is a solid truck and a worthwhile companion for sure. Onto the Tatra Phoenix, which I pretty much just use as a tanker truck. It has a unique tanker that it shares with the Tatra Force, but this truck cannot do quite as much as the Tatra Force can. It cannot utilize both the crane and sideboard bed together, meaning you have to select between them, but you can run the crane with the saddle. Again, both all-wheel drive and diff lock are on a toggle, but the all-wheel drive of this truck will cost more fuel. A note for both Tatra trucks is that the wheel hit points are actually set to 100 as opposed to the regular 50 of what other trucks normally have giving you a durability boost. I think to this day I've only broken one wheel on a Tatra truck. Another unique aspect to this truck is that it has all-wheel steering making the handling brilliant, especially for carving through muddy terrain. Ordinarily, wiggle steering through tough terrain aids just the front wheels, but with the Tetra Phoenix, when you wiggle all the wheels, this compensates more for the mediocre tyre options. Moving on, Phase 6 brought us the ANK Mark 38 Civilian, and there really isn't much to say about this. The performance is identical to the regular ANK Mark 38, so a 200 litre fuel tank, chunky tyre options, and it can be very fast. However, the civilian variant has the potential to equip either saddle, a tanker, or van body for repairs. It is available from level 1 for 75,000, so it makes for a quite nice starter truck as it has all-wheel drive and diff lock always on and good stock tyre options. 
So, you know, it's a good pick for New Game Plus, but perhaps not recommended for hard mode given the thirst of the engine. When using this truck, do be aware that because of the truck's speed, be careful of rocks and branches as they will tear down the wheels and suspension parts in no time at all. A decent utility truck, but perhaps not to be relied upon in the long run. Onto the unique Aramatsu Forester. This dedicated logging truck features a swiveling cabin whenever you start to use the crane and also a light on the manipulator, meaning you can easily use the log crane in first person in either day or night conditions. This truck has an articulated frame and independent rocker suspension to ensure maximum contact with the ground at all times for all eight wheels. Speaking of eight wheels, all wheel drive is always on, however diff lock is on a toggle. Chunky mud tires help this truck soldier through most terrains with ease, though it is not the fastest vehicle ever built. Suited for both short and medium logs, this truck can also tow a trailer enabling more log transport or whatever else needs to be moved. I do wish though however that the switch between short and medium logs was achievable in the function menu rather than having to go back to the garage. The reason for this is the add-on design itself for medium logs is a set of rails that slides out from the back of the vehicle enabling a longer carriage for longer logs. Do be careful however when crossing rivers as this vehicle does not have a snorkel. The prize of phase 6 is the Tega 6455B and it arrives to destroy all in its path. Up there for sure as one of the best and most versatile trucks in the game, capable of using pretty much any add-on required, this longer wheelbase cousin to the Tega 6436 is built mostly the same. Still having all-wheel drive and diff lock always on for maximum performance regardless of conditions, but due to the smaller cabin, you can run now the crane flatbed trailer wombo combo for maximum cargo transportation. This Tega retains the massive tires if you want to use them and does feature a spare wheel on the roof which is nice and prevents you scraping the undercarriage of the truck. However, obtaining this truck does take a few hours as you are required to complete a series of contracts to rebuild the lumber mill in phase 6 itself, but it is definitely worth it. The longer wheelbase does mean that the turning circle isn't quite as tight as some other trucks, but and as always with fast trucks, do be aware of small rocks and branches as these will annihilate the, the various parts of the truck. I don't particularly want to dwell on phase seven, but I must. So starting with the Azov 43191 Sprinter, uh, this is primarily a racing truck added for this specific DLC. It has no practical use in SnowRunner at all. It cannot support other trucks because it is just four-wheel drive and it will struggle in harsh conditions compared to any 6x6 or 8x8 truck. Its only function is driving around some of the contests in Phase 7. I mean, yes, it does have all-wheel drive and diff lock always on, but it has fairly limited tyre options. In fact, for dirt racing, its best tyre option is actually the chain tyre. So outside of phase 7 there is literally no use or need for this vehicle and it is a shame that nothing practical was actually added for this particular update. All other trucks can be used outside of the DLC that they were intended for but not this one. Now following up with the Gore by 4 with its silly little clown horn, at least this can tow a trailer but obviously it won't do it very well because it's tiny. All wheel drive and diff lock are both on a toggle and the tyres that actually come with it are the best for the vehicle which is pretty rare. Definitely usable as a scout so long as there isn't much mud for the journey, however this vehicle severely lacks durability. The tyres are fine but the suspension has just 100 hit points so a big hit can be crippling. You do carry some spares on the roof and it isn't worth sharing them with another truck unless absolutely necessary. Not sure if it was just me but I also found that driving this thing at speed was not easy as it just squirrels around all over the place. Rounding off year 2 with phase 8 and the Kirovets K700. This is the first tractor you will take possession of and it is pretty good for what it's intended for. You will definitely want to make sure that you have the appropriate engine and gearbox upgrades prior to its use though as although it isn't useless without them it does need the extra power. All wheel drive and diff lock are always on to prevent wheel spinning like crazy the way it did in the initial release so glad that was fixed. Capable of towing farming trailers and having a bale loading fork or a van body, it can carry out a few different tasks and it does make for a decent recovery vehicle. The bale fork can be a little tricky to use, but you're not entirely dependent on it which takes the edge off a bit. 
good speed on roads and four options for tires to select from, though there's little difference between them, so it's mostly aesthetic. When farming though, do have a fuel tanker nearby for replenishment, as you won't be able to fully farm on one big field on one tank of fuel. Definitely a fun drive, especially as the snorkel is on the roof, so water isn't a problem either. So this is a good candidate for rescuing the very next truck in this list, which is the Kiravets K7M, which is a modern rework of the K700. Unfortunately, this truck does have less power overall, which I find a little odd, but don't let that dissuade you. It's decent at hauling trailers, from regular farm equipment to regular trailers, all-wheel drive and diff lock are always on, as they should be, and a healthy fuel tank will keep you tractoring for a good while. This vehicle reaches its peak when you acquire its tyre upgrade. This enables you to equip the double wheels, which have ultra-level mud performance, though it does slightly hinder the turning circle, but that matters little. As with the K700, the K7M snorkel is on the roof, so watch it plough through flooded areas with absolute ease. Again, make sure you have the advanced special gearbox from Alaska, plus the various engine upgrades for maximum potential. A difference between this tractor and the K700 is that this one lacks the bale loader fork, though this isn't so bad as you can lift bales with a crane anyway. This too would also make a solid recovery vehicle given the traction and power of the tractor. The last thing to note with both tractors is the lack of suspension in the same manner as the CAT TH357, so off-roading will be bumpy as all hell. Rounding off the last of the year 2 seasonal vehicles with the Step 39331 Pike, this plucky little off-roader that is easy to get hold of is a great, great workhorse. Capable of running many add-ons, plus great power to weight on top of all-wheel drive and diff lock always on, solid mud tire options mean that this truck is basically the whole package for general day-to-day -day operations. The fuel tank can be a bit of a limiting factor at just 250 litres, but this isn't so bad. In the initial release of the PTS, this truck had access to a crane flatbed and trailer combo, but changes were made for the full release, and the flatbed was exchanged for a unique sideboard bed, which is huge, and it also prevents that combo from being enabled, which is a big shame. I used this truck a lot during the PTS phase prior to the release of Phase 8, and can definitely recommend giving this truck a go. This final section includes vehicles outside of the yearly content passes, so it covers free releases and paid truck packs. I will name the trucks and their respective DLCs in release order and whether or not it is worth buying them. So first up is the... The Navistar 5000 MV, which was the pre-order bonus truck, is an absolute unit. And thanks to Angry Ginger Life for the footage, as I don't actually have access to this truck. A 340 litre fuel tank may not actually last that long, given that this truck is pretty damn thirsty despite all-wheel drive being always on. The Navistar is also a very quick truck despite its bulk, but unfortunately and unusually, this heavy class truck lacks diff lock. This is where more weaknesses crop up. No mud tires and the lack of diff lock really do hinder this truck in deep mud, whereas shallow mud and dirt conditions should be okay. Although it is available from the start of the game, if you actually have this truck, its usability does decline as you progress through the game as more and more viable trucks become available. A minor issue too is the exhaust placement. They cannot be moved so the third person view is often occluded ruining the driving experience. Up next is the Khan 39 Marshall from the High Roller Pack or if you purchase the Year 1 Pass. The Khan Marshall is a plucky little scout which is a great early game assistant for exploring and hitting those watchtowers especially given that it has all wheel drive and diff lock always on combined with massive ground clearance and chunky tyres that are better than most in the mud. The truck has good speed, but a rather small fuel tank at just 40 litres, and the engine can be fairly consumption heavy, sometimes getting up to nearly 6 litres per minute, which for a small vehicle is a hell of a lot. Fortunately, there is a roof rack available with spare fuel and repair points to keep you running in the wilderness. On the flip side, the truck is a little top heavy, so rolling over can be a problem, but if you have the autonomous winch, you should be able to get yourself out of more situations. The truck does have a tow bar, but annoyingly, it cannot tow a trailer, which is a huge shame, because with the ground clearance, it would theoretically do a good job. Would I buy this if I was starting out fresh with no other DLC? Absolutely. Onto the Chevrolet Apache from the Classico pack. This six-wheel drive beast, to me, looks fairly odd. I don't know what it is, it just doesn't sit right. However, it is powerful and it can carry a lot of spare parts, spare fuel and spare tires, rocking that mobile repair garage in a similar vein to the Ford F750 and the Resvani Hercules. Diff lock is always on, but the all-wheel drive is on a toggle, so that will cost you more fuel to use. 
Large diameter but narrow tires keep the Apache out of the mud in a similar manner to the Zix 605R, and this truck does a decent job at getting through water and mud. A 95 litre fuel tank is nice and healthy and great for exploration and assisting trucks in the field. In the same light as the Resvani Hercules, there is no tow bar for this vehicle, a missed opportunity to improve its utility as it would be great for towing the Scout fuel trailer for an extra 900 litres of fuel, though you can often just find them out in the world. Would I buy this truck if starting out fresh? I would, as you will get a lot of use out of this truck throughout the entire game. Next is the Western Star 49X, which released alongside Phase 2 in the 49X pack. And I'll admit that I jumped straight onto this truck when it was released, and I was a little disappointed. No mud tires, and the mission to haul the Cat 770G was tough with this truck. I have since learned from my mistakes, and I'm more aware of when to use a truck like this. It is a great looking truck, but it has all wheel drive and diff lock on a toggle, which will perform okay until you hit deep mud. Capable of running a multitude of add ons from trailer hauler to log carrier, you can use this truck to fill any gap in your arsenal. Fuel tank is a decent size 290 litres, though with all wheel driving gauge, you'll have to keep an eye on your fuel gauge. A sour point on this truck is the lift axle the truck has, and I really wish that the tyres on the axle match the tyres you actually equip to the truck, because why else would you run two different sets of tyres? Would I buy this truck again? Uh, honestly, no. Onto the GMC Brigadier 8000 from the content pack of the same name, and this truck falls into an unfortunate category that exists in SnowRunner. This is a group of heavy duty and off-road US trucks that are essentially identical in abilities and only differ in their appearance. As is the way in SnowRunner, this US truck has no mud tire options so will run the UOD2 tires like nearly every other US truck. Yes, it can run the majority of add-ons but so can the base game trucks. All wheel drive and diff lock are on a toggle and the fuel tank is sub 300 litres, so what makes this truck stand out against so many trucks of the same type? I mean, yes, it can run a flatbed and the magnetic detector module together, but that's it. Its power is decent and it holds trailers well, but it doesn't really stand out. Would I buy this truck if I was starting again? No. With the announcement of the year 2 content, the anniversary DLC firstly brought the Caterpillar CT681. This truck is near enough a carbon copy of the base game Cat CT680 in its abilities and its downsides plus more. All wheel drive and diff lock are on a toggle for this heavy duty truck, but without any form of suspension lift kit, but the addition of a lift axle, this truck is hindered in the mud even more than normal. You can still use a variety of add-ons and the fuel consumption rates are fairly decent. It just suits tasks that are a bit more niche, i.e. avoiding deep mud where appropriate. The truck has the same speed and power as the regular CT680, but I will always use the regular CT680 over this one. Avoid high saddle contracts with this truck unless you love the life of pain, and you will probably be getting the most out of this truck in Alaska and Phase 8. On the upside, this truck and the next one are both free to obtain, and free stuff is always nice, and once in game, you can always just sell it if you don't like it. Next is the International HX 520 from the Anniversary DLC, and this truck is in the same category of trucks as the Brigadier from a few minutes ago, which is why I'm using the ramp towing platform. UOD2 tires, less than 300 litres of fuel in the tank, and all-wheel drive and diff lock are on a toggle. Does that sound familiar? It's practically a cut and paste job again, with the only difference is the truck's aesthetics. On this truck, the wheelbase, which is the distance between the front and rear axles, is huge, which increases the turning circle to the next level. There are trucks that definitely overlap with this truck, so if you want a lot of redundancy in your fleet, then that's great. Just make sure you avoid deep mud. I won't lie that this truck is decent to drive, but nothing really jumps out about it. It is part of the anniversary DLC, which is free, so yes, you shouldn't shun free stuff. So if you aren't keen on it, then just sell it. If this truck was part of a DLC that you had to buy, then I would not buy it. The Tatra T805 from the Tatra Dual Pack is a teeny tiny truck in the same vein as the Acteon. I mean, look how big the trailer is compared to this truck. So yeah, I recommend against towing trailers with this truck. It does, however, come with a custom van body add-on and a small tanker add-on, as this truck is intended absolutely to be a support vehicle. It has an excellent 190 litre fuel tank, and even when the all-wheel drive is engaged, the fuel consumption rate is fine, so you'll be driving for a long time indeed. 
the diff lock is on a toggle, which is a shame, but this truck does a good job of getting around the map on its own. I have to admit, though, that I haven't really used this truck at all. This is mostly down to the fact that I almost exclusively play hard mode with my rule set of not buying any extra trucks. Would I ordinarily use this truck? Probably not, as there are much bigger trucks that can function in the support role. Next is the Tatra T813 from the Tatra Dual Pack, and this is the truck that you buy the Tatra Pack for. Coming out alongside the release of Phase 5, the T813 has been an awesome ally for me when not playing hard mode. I've used it in many situations just for its brute force alone. A little unorthodox in that the all-wheel drive and diff lock are both on a toggle, which is odd for such a big truck, though it isn't super fast in the first place, so not being able to utilize the high gear and diff lock always on is no biggie. A mega 380 litre fuel tank plus 160 spare litres of fuel on the roof enables you to be trundling around pretty much forever. I tested this truck for heavy trailer towing and this is one of the best, only really outdone by the Zix 605R and the two Colob trucks. Downsides for this truck is that the add-ons are very limited to just the high saddle, sideboard bed and a ramp towing platform. It's a great early addition and assistant later on, but maybe falls behind a bit as you progress more through the game. So this truck and the previous make up the Tatra Dual Pack and would I buy it fresh? Yes, I would. They bring more variety and ability, especially the T813 with its roof snorkel and big chunky tires. It's a bit like an Azov 6, but with fewer add-ons. The next pack features the Jeep Renegade from the Jeep Dual Pack, a small 4x4 scout truck with all-wheel drive and diff lock on a toggle, mediocre mud tires, but a decent sized fuel tank. I mean, what else do you say? It's not a terrible truck in all honesty, but this and the Wrangler are definitely fan service trucks and I don't think they really fit into the SnowRunner cinematic universe given their small stature because in order to do well in SnowRunner, being oversized is king. A small roof rack will help keep itself going to assist with early map exploration, hitting those watchtowers and collecting upgrades. If there wasn't a roof rack, I wouldn't use this at all as the fuel consumption isn't great. There isn't much more to say, which is a shame. The Superior Wrangler from the Jeep Dual Pack has more power and a more economical engine, providing greater exploration potential, though it does have similar pitfalls to the Renegade, given its low ground clearance, even with the loftiest suspension upgrades. Avoid trailers, as small scouts don't tow trailers very well, as we all know. To sum up, the Jeep Dual Pack is definitely for fan service, and it's nice if you're wanting to collect all the trucks, but they really don't add anything to the game. You're just paying for the brands. I'd be more inclined to use these vehicles if their unique tires were actually more capable than the stock MS mud tires. I'm not asking for huge overpowered boosts, but enough to make a difference, or else I might as well just use the Chevy CK1500, which I don't have to pay £5 for. Don't buy this pack if you think these trucks will improve your garage. Up now is the Step 3364 Crocodile from the Crocodile Pack. This is a truck almost stuck between being a big scout and a small off-roader. It's bigger than the Tuzaktion, but with similar capabilities. This truck comes with a unique sideboard bed and van body add-on. The sideboard bed, despite its size, is actually just a single slot, so it's not hugely practical. So it makes this truck a bit more suited to repairs in the field for those truck recovery missions. All-wheel drive and diff lock are always on, which is always a win, coupled with those balloon tires for optimal performance in most conditions. Expect around 15 minutes solid driving time, though the fuel consumption is variable peaking fairly high for a truck with a 150 litre fuel tank. Despite the small stature, there are a variety of basic add-ons you can use for this truck, including the aforementioned sideboard and van body, fuel tanker, high and low saddle, and a roof rack. On a side note, though not major, the sideboard bed does actually include 60 more litres of spare fuel, which is not bad. Though you can use a high saddle, I wouldn't recommend it at all. The Tuz Acteon is a superior cousin to this truck for reference, so would I buy this again? For its practical uses, not really. There are vehicles part of the season pass that do a better job than this. On to the Land Rover Defender 90 from the Land Rover Dual Pack, and this will feel like deja vu. A very familiar off-roader, especially if you're British, unique paint schemes, all-wheel drive and diff lock on a toggle, and having to use the stock MS mud tires leave you a bit underwhelmed. The Defender 90 can tow a trailer, but I wouldn't, given the classic tropes of small scout trucks being unable to tow trailers through mud without having to winch everywhere. 
An 80 litre fuel tank is not bad as the fuel consumption doesn't get very high at all. You do get a decent roof rack add-on supplying a further 100 litres of fuel plus some repair parts. The second part of the Land Rover pack is the Defender 110 which is the larger Defender mostly seen on farms in Britain. You get the same roof rack pretty much as the Defender 90, the same fuel tank, same all-wheel drive system, same diff lock toggle. You will need to use the stock MS mud tires again and the ground clearance means it'll be difficult to not get stuck in mud. Like with the Jeep Jewel pack, these vehicles are providing fan service rather than actually being practical in SnowRunner, where bigger is objectively better. Yes, they are cool, but you really can't take them through mud without always needing a winch, which for me is just no fun. So I would have to take my chances cutting through the forests. Would I buy this pack again? It's the same answer as the Jeep pack. For collecting trucks, sure, go for it. But for practical use, don't bother. Now onto the Western Star 47X NF1424 from the Western Star Wolfpack. The first truck from this triple truck pack has a mouthful of a name. I give all three trucks a thorough test in the live stream linked in the top right. This is the 47X that doesn't have five axles and actually makes for a solid trailer hauler. All wheel drive and diff lock are on a toggle, but this isn't much of an issue because this truck has a lot of power under the bonnet. As standard with most US trucks, UOD2 tires are the go-to. The fuel tank can be a bit limiting, but there is a roof rack for assisting longevity. I do enjoy using this truck. It does feel like a good truck, which is what you want when you pay directly for a truck pack. Other add-ons are limited on this truck, as it is fairly small, so you won't be taking logging contracts with this, for example. Just watch out for deep mud, given the tyre options. How many wheels do you want? If your answer is yes, then you want the Western Star 47X NF1430, from the Western Star Wolfpack. You get five axles on this truck and two of them are lift axles, which isn't ideal really. No diff lock, an all-wheel drive is on a toggle and I know what you're thinking, that just sounds useless, right? Well, actually, no. OHD two tires and all-wheel drive are kind of a weird magical combo that just works. In the Wolfpack testing live stream, I enjoyed this truck the most by far. It can run a range of add-ons covering saddles, logging, flatbed, tanker, band body, seismic vibrator, and crane. Only add-on missing really is a roof rack. It has a 290 litre fuel tank and okay fuel consumption as it will change often so only use the all-wheel drive when necessary. As is the way with the Western Star trucks, they have power coming every which way so there's no problem on that front. On to the last of the Wolfpack trucks, the runt of the litter, the Western Star 57X is a highway truck in a game where there are very few roads at all. This is a truck for touring continents given the accommodation module on the back of the cabin. I mean, it's got a great paint job and exhaust setup, but it runs so close to the ground. You can increase the ground clearance marginally by changing the bodywork options, but this isn't enough. Definitely a truck for Alaska and the roads of phase 8. It only has all-wheel drive and that is on a toggle and add-ons are also limited to just the two saddles, a loading crane and the log carrier front. And I would definitely never take this logging as logging camps are always muddy so this truck will just get stuck immediately. You cannot use the saddle and the loading crane together so the crane has no real use and I wouldn't use the high saddle either given how low the truck rides. Now this truck pack features three trucks for the same cost as the two truck pack. So are the two truck packs overpriced or are the three trucks here underpriced? Well, I'm gonna go with the latter as the 57X is fairly useless really. The two remaining 47X variants have their uses. So would I buy this truck again? Uh, yes, I would. Lastly, after 78 trucks, we reach the 79th, the Resvani Hercules from the content pack of the same name. This released alongside Phase 8 and it is probably one of the most unique looking trucks I've ever seen given its futuristic vibes and god awful interior. A 6x6 layout with all wheel drive on a toggle gives you the ability to smash off road terrain. In the same manner as the Apache and the F750 you can load up the Hercules with loads of spare fuel, repair points and spare tyres for that mobile repair garage vibe. The stock Hercules tyres are ok but the MS1 tyres are slightly better as always. An 80 litre fuel tank is okay, though the fuel consumption can vary to up to nearly 7 litres per minute, but your speed will often determine your fuel consumption. No damn tow bar, damn it! There are a lot of visual changes you can make to this truck, and I implore you to ignore them all completely. If you do equip, then you'll be taking damage like there's no tomorrow. 
I'm not sure what the cosmetics do to the hitboxes of the wheels, suspension, and the engine, but the fenders, thresholds, wheel arches are devastating to the truck's durability. Run the bodywork as default and you'll be fine. Would I buy this again? Yes, I would. It has a lot of use for exploration and vehicular support, so yes. There will be a year three pass and I will cover that in the same manner as this once phase 12 has released and if you've missed any part of this mini series you can click the link on screen for the rest of the playlist. If you've watched all the other videos then thank you very much for watching and have a great day.